Okay, we'll get uh, started. So our next uh, speaker is Dr. Jia Lu from uh, uh, Microsoft Researcher, where he's uh, uh, Microsoft Research, where he's a principal researcher, and he's the manager of the Sensing and Energy Research Group. Um, he's published broadly in areas like sensor networks, embedded systems, uh, and data center energy efficiency. Um, he's received uh, numerous awards, including the Lian Chu Award from UC Berkeley uh, in 2001, where he also received his PhD degree. Um, and he's chaired a variety of conferences. Uh, and he's also an ACM Distinguished Scientist since uh, 2011. So it's my pleasure to introduce you. And today he'll be talking about uh, discovering the genome of data centers. So welcome. Thank you for the introduction, and I really enjoy this event. Um, so, yeah, I have a fairly broad interest in a var variety of topics, but this particular talk, I want to focus on uh, data centers. I um, want to put the acknowledgement up front. This is actually a collaboration of many people, both from the Microsoft and uh, Microsoft Research side, and our collaborators in academia and intern students. Um, and research groups in various schools. The problem we're looking at is the, really the scaling out of uh, cloud services that we enjoy every day, sort of take for granted. Uh, things like search engines, things like instant messaging, cloud computing, all the benefits we got from social networking, media streaming, and everything. And talk about what's behind it. Um, are these gigantic buildings and lots of iron metals in it and lots of energy got pumped into it. So this is one of the data centers Microsoft has in Texas. Uh, it's a 50 megawatt facility. Um, if you compare sort of the cars and the houses, you roughly get a sense of how big the building is, full of servers in it. This is not the biggest one. The biggest one is probably very close to here is in Chicago. It's more than 100 megawatts. So basically, you can pump an entire power station into that. Um, once right, uh, people start to building these things, in the recent years, a lot of news, if you, if you uh, follow these, get into the energy consumptions of data centers or the IT industry in general. Right? Comments you, you see are things like, uh, we're doubling every five years. And uh, in 2006, I believe, it takes about 2% of US energy consumption. Not a too big a deal. Uh, but it, since it's growing, it's, it's actually one of the fastest growing uh, uh, industrial sector in terms of energy consumption, um, equivalent to 5.8 million household um, uh, usage in 2006. And people basically do the projection and say, okay, in the future, you're going to pay more in the power than buying the server themselves and you have to build uh, the entire new uh, power generation every year you build will basically got consumed by data centers. And that's not a sustainable way of, of growth. Um, so what's in there? Uh, if you've been to a data center, the first thing you see are these racks of servers. That's what most people's impression is. And of course, they're connected uh, to the outside to the internet. And but you don't usually see is the whole power system to, uh, to power these things up, all the way from getting the power from the grid, transformers, different layers of uh, circuit breakers, the UPS for backup, uh, power distribution network, and uh, that goes to the racks. In order to uh, uh, get the good quality of the powers, not fully rely on the grid, there's a backup generator, usually gasoline powered, uh, sometimes it's a big rotary machine, to um, feed into the UPS. And then there's the entire cooling system that um, in order to make sure these servers run at the uh, specified condition and, and make them reliable, uh, usually people pump cold air into, into these uh, uh, machine rooms and using something called a computer room uh, AC system, the crack, 
and that, sup that is supplied using the co cold water. Of course, then you need a chill water tower uh, outside. And the way that people usually calculate the energy efficiency of these facilities is something called the PUE, which is um, uh, roughly defined as the total power consumed by the servers divided by the total power consumed by the facility. The uh, intuition behind it is, is to say the servers are the things that's doing the real job. And everything else, all these facility uh, uh, support system is the overhead. And this number is usually uh, is, is, is a number. Oh, actually, I, I should flip it. It's the utility over the server. So it's a number that's greater than 1 that, that uh, highlights the overhead. Um, so if you look at the cost of running these data centers, Power itself is not uh, that big a deal. So it's about a quarter of the total cost. If you amortize the server, the facility, and so on. Um, the server itself is still the, high, the, the biggest cost that uh, you have to replace them roughly three, uh, every three years because of the newer uh, silicon technologies and storage capabilities come up. But on the other hand, all this facility infrastructure uh, side of the investment is actually proportional to the power that you can supply to these servers. So if you break down, say, the architecture cost, um, the, the land is a very small sliver. Although it's a gigantic building, people usually find these places that doesn't cost a lot to buy the land to build them. The majority goes to the electrical system. That's the uh, uh, power distribution network, the backup energy. Um, and also the mechanical system, which is the cooling. So more than half of the infrastructure cost which could take $500 million to build each of these big uh, facilities, goes into the mechanical and electrical uh, system. So that's why this is very important. Power is important both in the sense of operation cost and in the sense of it defines uh, how much you have to put into the infrastructure. So the server power consumptions are not static. It's not like a light bulb. If I turn it on, it just stays on forever. Um, there's a big gap between you put the servers into sleep versus you just power it up and run nothing on it. Right? You just turn it on, have the operating system running. doesn't give it any workload. You get about 60% of the peak uh, power consumption right there. And after that, as, as you pump up, the uh, utilization, the power goes almost linearly from a 60% to 100% of the peak power. The workload is not sta uh, stationary. So this is a workload from a messenger service a few years ago uh, over a week. So you see that around uh, noon time or maybe 2 p.m. Pacific time, that's where the service requests reach the peak. That's both the East Coast and West Coast are online. And after midnight, uh, you got the valley. That's where uh, most people are not online chatting. And, and you have weekdays and weekend that also uh, has slight differences. And through these um, variations, uh, if you convert them into the power consumption, you also see these variations in how much power these servers are taking. Of course, this is just continuous uh, uh, running. And on top of that, you have disruptions, like a new service got deployed, uh, software got upgraded, or machine got crashed, the VM got migrated away. So the power consumption in these, uh, from the servers themselves uh, can be quite complicated. Uh, you see two spikes down here. Those are two instances of server crash. So the, the power consumption goes to zero. Uh, so if we look at the dynamics in a facility like a data center, there are uh, a quadrant you can put them in. Uh, there's the computing, the temporal variations of, of the utilization of the servers themselves, which roughly convert to the temporal variations in the uh, physical infrastructure, like power consumption, like the need for cooling. There's also the spatial variations. Uh, this plot shows you how the servers uh, a group of 300 servers are talking to each other. There are servers that are <coughs> tightly coupled. They always talk to each other. There are some server that got highly stressed and a lot of server depends on it. But there are many servers that are roughly uh, uh, scattered around and they don't really talk to each other. So those kind of dynamics is, is uh, application specific and also 
it changes from one version of the software to the next. And uh, there's the physical spatial dynamics. This is the heat map of, uh, of the input temperature of a row of racks. You see the variations uh, from different places in that, uh, in that row, and there are certain hot spots that uh, you probably need to uh, aggressively cool them, and some cold spots, which means you're wasting the cool air. So what do we do with uh, energy efficiencies in data center? So you can uh, basically classify the technologies into three categories. Um, we want to reduce the power consumptions themselves. Uh, the better we reduce, uh, the lower infrastructure costs we need to pay, the lower operation costs we need to pay, the less energy we, uh, we need from the grid. Or you can, uh, there are people look at renewable energies. This is to rely on power, uh, wind and solar and um, um, renewable energy sources. Those are um, good in the sense they, uh, they're free, but they're bad in the sense the availability and variations, um, the supply is very different from the, uh, the power grid. And then uh, you can think about reusing en the energy. Uh, this is uh, not a whole lot of work goes into this, but uh, for example, the energy that data center consumes essentially turn into heat. And how to use that waste heat, uh, maybe to heat up a building. We have some work that, that we call data furnaces. You can essentially use server racks as furnace at home and uh, supply that uh, computing to the grid. Um, th this talk, we're going to primarily focus on the energy reduction side and um, try to model and understand uh, what we can do to make, make a data center uh, uh, less uh, depend on uh, the amount of energy you need. Uh, in terms of the techniques, what can we do? The data center energy reduction is not that different from, uh, say, your everyday life energy reductions. The first thing you want to think about is the low power, more efficient hardware. Uh, in the analogy of using the compact fluorescent uh, light, right, rather than um, the high power light bulbs. Relax operation conditions. Open your window if you have natural light uh, coming in. That's one thing that's probably the most effective to reduce the cooling cost in data center. And you see some of the numbers released by state-of-the-art data centers. They, they said that PoE is 1.02 or things like that. They're essentially using the outside air to cool it uh, rather than using uh, uh, chilled air. Of course, uh, the, the nat uh, analogy to the natural light, right? You've got different level of, of lights. And the same thing for outside air. You've got different temperatures of the, uh, of the air. Uh, air temperature, and uh, that changes your operation conditions. Energy proportional computing. Turn off your servers if you don't use them. Right? Make your number of servers proportional to the workload. Uh, easier said than, than do. Um, infrastructure oversubscription. This is a little interesting. Uh, the analogy I, I would make is to say, don't use 200 watt light bulbs, rather to use 60 watt light bulbs. If you want to read a book, use the lamp. If you want to your brother also want to read a book, then you have to share that lamp. Um, and that creates problems. Uh, at the end, uh, consolidation. This is to say, invite your neighbor's kid to do homework in your house so they can turn off their lights. Um, so it's, these are very natural that people would do every day. But because of the complex dynamics in the data center, and we want to preserve the quality of services to people who use the data center, that become more uh, involved. And the project we have called Data Genome is a data-driven way that we try to understand different uh, dynamics in the data center to uh, do better capacity planning, uh, better data center design, and better uh, control of resources in it. And we start with sensing, uh, sense everything. Uh, in terms of the variables that people care about or that's important to the uh, data center operation. The first one is the asset location. This sounds uh, trivial, that you have a server, you put them in, they shouldn't move. Uh, the reality is, in all the big data centers we encounter within Microsoft and or in other companies, we have 
about 90% accuracy of where the servers are. Meaning, right, if you multiply that by a million servers, there's a good number of servers you don't really know where they are. Uh, we've been building some hardware. Uh, this is a combination of RFIDs and wireless sensors to track the server locations. So this, at the, at the uh, rack slot level, once you put the server in, we find out where they are. And that gives us uh, accurate uh, server location. Electrical wiring, again, uh, sounds trivial. Like, where the, which circuit does the server got plugged into? Um, in reality, uh, these servers are installed by people, you pay the minimum wage, and you give them a sheet and say, this should be the convention, and they go in there, they, find, they couldn't find the right circuit uh, uh, port or right, right uh, uh, length of the cable, they just plug in uh, wherever they want. Uh, but because you want to do uh, circuit level, uh, circuit breaker level uh, power capping and, and, and things like that, you have to have a good wiring uh, uh, map of the, of the servers. We've done some work of generating a signature from the servers, then detect it from the circuit breaker power meter level so we can map which server plug into uh, which uh, circuit. Network wiring, again, uh, Lots of human error could, uh, uh, could be introduced. Uh, but the good thing about network wiring is the network blueprints uh, you can do from the network management software. Uh, that's relatively easy. Server types, to keep track of which server runs what, um, uh, what services. This is easy as long as you have a good IP and you have a di uh, diligent product groups that manages, because they have to, uh, uh, the deployment, to manage the deployment. Server virtualization, this is probably the, the easiest thing um, that the operating system will provide you. What's the processor utilization, network I.O., storage utilization, and so on. Power consumption is uh, cheap to do at the circuit level. It's hard to do, or it costs a lot to do at the per server level. Uh, we have some work that basically can convert the server utilization by training a model and convert them into the, uh, uh, the power consumptions. Heat distribution, uh, again, very hard to do in a, in a very fine grain um, fashion. This is where we designed uh, some sensor networks to, uh, uh, to collect the data. And, uh, there's a lot of work goes into the reliability network protocols and so on, but I'm not going to talk about that. Airflow is an important parameter we'll see uh, later on. Weather conditions outside, that matters a lot from the, uh, the cooling point of view. And electricity availability and price from uh, the point of view of whether you want to migrate workload actually across data centers or how, how much you have to provision the backup UPS and power generators. So lots of parameters that matters in terms of efficient operation of a data center. Um, our goal is to collect all of them and put them together and analyze them. So uh, what you can do with all that data? There's the easy, the hard, and the ugly. Uh, the easy thing is to do is eyeballing, right? You can look at the data and you learn something from it. Or you can compute statistics. You can say uh, how, how a uh, how much my servers are utilized, how much my uh, facility is utilized, um, should we, sh shall we buy new equipment, and so on. Uh, or you can even do a Monte Carlo simulation to um, look at, uh, uh, predict into the future. So we built some of these. Uh, these are some of the visualization tools. This one gives you a top view of the uh, most of the uh, equipment utilization in a data center. Different colors, this, each of these block is a rack. Different colors of the rack shows you how empty they are. So this is essentially an empty rack. This is a rack that's very full. Uh, the green, uh, green or yellow numbers at the bottom shows you the utiliz power utilization of that rack. Um, so you may not be able to see you roughly see about 30% here. That's very typical in, uh, in data center. We're going to talk about how to make uh, this essentially the power over subscription story uh, we care about. Uh, these are the AC equipments and how much AC you have. So this one has 40, only 40% 40 utilization. They have more capacity in here than somewhere there in the data center. So that allows you to do 
things like uh, change management. Management. If I want to install 10 servers, I can go in and say, where do I have space? Where do I have extra power? Where do I have extra cooling? And so on. Uh, this is a more of a statistical view. This is the uh, psychometric chart, which shows the temperature and humidity in a, uh, in a single chart. And some of these dots shows you the, uh, the operation, operating conditions uh, over the time. And uh, there was an experiment of of uh, trying to use more outside air to cool it, so that the orange part, which essentially will have higher temperature variation and um, a higher humidity, is due to the outside air. Um, so those are things that the data center operators can visually see and, and uh, learn how well they're operating. Uh, these are a little fancier uh, visualization. You can, you can um, create these temperature contours. This is the front side of a row of servers. Uh, we'll come back with, to this a little later, but the coolest, coolest spot is not at the bottom, although the cool air comes from the bottom to cool the entire rack. Uh, because of the so-called Bernoulli effect, the fast moving air actually draw the hot air from the, uh, from the back to the front. So sometimes they actually create hot spots at the bottom. So the center of the rack, is, uh, rack row is usually the coolest. Uh, the top this is where the, your cold air essentially hasn't, uh, uh, is not uh, enough to reach the top. Um, another thing you can do from these statistics and traces is to do power over subscription, as I said. So usually when a server, your bio server, it gives you uh, the rated power consumption. So this is a 300 watt server. What does it mean is the manufacturer add together all the components in there uh, with respect to their highest power consumption individually and give you this, this number that will never reach so in reality. Uh, in reality, a possible peak, this could be done through uh, measurement. If we power a server, we stress it. We give, you, give it 100% workload and um, read and write the disk at the same time and so on. And that's the possible peak, which is lower than the rated power. Uh, in reality, right, you may have uh, variations uh, that the server utilization actually goes up and down. So when you calculate how much server you, sh you can put into a, a rack or a, a data center, you shouldn't use the rated peak, although that's typically what people would use. Right? If I have a 100 kilowatt uh, room and I have a, a 300 watt server, and that's how many, I divide the two numbers, that's how many servers I want to put in. So that leaves a lot of, uh, uh, power capacity just sitting on the floor, that's people call the stranded power, that uh, you're not using it. Uh, using the possible peak certainly will certainly help. That says using the same facility, now I can put in more servers. Using the actual capacity will be a lot better, but since there are statistics of these things will go up and down, you have to worry about at what percentage you can allow these uh, these uh, power spikes, can you tolerate that? And that related to a technology called power capping. If this is reaching the, uh, the capacity, then I need to do something to top up these uh, spikes. Um, another thing you can do, just with the statistics of these data, is to do these Monte Carlo simulations and make, uh, say, server purchase uh, decisions. So. Uh, these lines are three different uh, uh, predictions of what's the uh, utilize server utilization growth. And these blue lines are say, uh, I'm going to buy some number of servers at this point and that point. It take a while for me to gradually put these servers online because I need to install software and put them uh, connected network and so on. And this shows me the average utilization after I pump in more of those, uh, those number of servers. So those are the planning tools that the data center uh, operators can use based on these uh, uh, utilization data. So the, a little harder uh, problem to solve uh, and better optimization uh, we can do is to really look at the dynamics and the interactions between the physical variables and the computing variables. Uh, I should say that the easy part is the low hanging fruit, and that's where actually most of the benefits you can get from these data. You can really improve a lot from anecdotal operation of the data center to a data-driven uh, way of operating data center. And this just adds on top of 
of those values. Um, a couple of examples. For example, uh, we talk about uh, power over provisioning and uh, also the power capping, that when you, over uh, when you oversubscribe to the power capacity, uh, you have the servers that may reach a uh, particular uh, the threshold, and by that time, you want to curb the, uh, the utilization so you don't <coughs> trick the, uh, the circuit breaker. A more advanced version of that is power tracking. Uh, this is the scenario that, uh, let's say you lost a power, you start to use UPS, and when the power comes back on, you have to do two things. You have to both power the servers and go back and charge the UPS. And this is the curve of the UPS charging uh, uh, power consumption in order to charge the uh, in this case, we, we use the asset, uh, lead asset battery as the UPS. In order to charge them, this is the amount that the uh, UPS system requires. And the rest of that is what you can use on servers. So essentially, the control has to follow uh, what, um, uh, what the available power um, is through that, that curve. And there are two ways of, of doing that. One is through uh, so-called the DVFS. You change the uh, frequency and voltage of the servers, uh, essentially put them into different power mode so they can consume more or less of the power. Um, two is to shut down unimportant powers and you can, par uh, you, can, you can turn them back on when you have more power available. Um, so that's the tracking problem. Another problem is the uh, dynamic provisioning problem. Uh, this is to answer, to say we want the number of servers to follow the workload and you've seen this uh, workload variations in, in the messenger cluster. And this is how the messenger cluster, the front door of messenger cluster works. When the requests come in, it hits the dispatch server. The dispatch server periodically gets some report on these connection servers, how much they are utilized. And then it will pick one con connection server and say, okay, you should connect to that one. And from then on, your, your uh, instant messaging uh, connection stays until you uh, log off. Uh, the, as we said, the, the workload has variations. One thing we can do is to try to predict what the future workload look like in the short term so we can turn on just enough number of servers to, uh, to serve them. The way we do the prediction is, uh, uh, is the so-called seasonal data regression, which says uh, the workload of today is essentially similar to what the workload looked like last week and the week before and so on, although it's, it's growing gradually. So I'm going to use the historical data of uh, uh, long periodicity, this is the seasonal part, together with the data that I see, just the local trend of today, and put them together as my uh, uh, regression input. With that, we can do a fairly good prediction uh, in a half an hour uh, ahead on the number of connections and the new connections come into the system. Once we have good predictions, there are two policies we can use to select what the, uh, the right uh, connection servers to use. There's the load balancing way of doing it, right? Uh, this is the traditional way of of using uh, uh, scaling out uh, servers to say, I'm going to make sure everybody got the same amount of, of workload. And that means I give this server with less workload a little bit more, and this server with uh, uh, high workload a little bit less. Uh, if you have a very good prediction, that's good. So you can know exactly how many servers you need and just balance them out. If you don't have a very good prediction, uh, you can adopt something called load skewing to have the systems sort of react to the, the variations by themselves. The way it works, uh, it works is to say, uh, uh, I will set a threshold of the target utilization of every server. I'm going to give the server that has more uh, workload already, I'm going to keep giving it until it reaches the, uh, the threshold. And I'm going to starve this guy, which has the lowest number of connections already, and with the hope that eventually all these will die down and I can shut down that server. Uh, using the 
real data traces from Messenger, we did some uh, the studies of several algorithms based on uh, whether we want to forecast it or, or uh, it's more reactive, meaning I don't have a good model of the, uh, the, the, uh, the load variation. Uh, of course, uh, the, without any dynamic provisioning, you have to turn on all the servers. I think this case was um, 60 servers. Uh, we compare two things. One is the energy saving. The other is the number of people I have to kick out. If I'm really aggressive, I, have to, I want to get this number of uh, energy savings. I have to kick out some users, shut down the server uh, in a brute force way, and uh, how many people I need to kick out. Uh, we can see that if we do good prediction, just do load balancing and starve the, the, the servers that, that sort of outside my uh, predicted number of servers I need, uh, I have pretty good uh, savings, although I have to kick out a number of uh, people. If I don't do, if I just completely do skewing, I don't have any good models, I just skew my load, uh, I'm pretty good at um, user uh, satisfaction. I don't kick out that many users, although I pay a little bit more in terms of the, uh, the energy that uh, the server consumes. Now the question that the, we're crossing the domain, we want to answer is, let's say we can shut down 25% of the servers. Which 20%? They're not created equal because they're placed in different locations. Uh, in the data center and some places are easier to be cooled than other places. Turns out the, uh, it's fairly hard to predict which server is the coolest or, uh, or spot over time. Um, this shows the temperature variations from one particular server. I think this is the server at the bottom of the rack. Uh, when there's cold air blowing in, the temperature actually goes up. When there's less cold air blowing in, the temperature goes down. Uh, this, this shows you which part of the rack, we just roughly partition that into the top, middle, and bottom, which part of the rack has the hottest temperature. And you see it goes all over the place. There's sometimes the top is coolest, the hottest, sometimes the bottom is, is hottest, and so on. So uh, how can you make decisions on that? What makes things more complicated is the discrete actions. Uh, this is the temperature, input temperature plot we did. When we turn on two servers in a 10, 10 server uh, uh, setting, by turning on these, uh, no, by, by turning off these two servers, the effect is everybody's input temperature goes up. So that's sort of also uh, counterintuitive, right? The explanation is the server's local fan actually helps you to pump the, help the air circulation. Once you turn off a server, the server become empty box. The hot air is actually, can go from the, the back to the front. So essentially everything nearby experiences a hotter temperature. Similarly, if everybody's off, I just turn on a pair of servers, I see everybody's in, intake temperature goes down because of the air circulation is getting better. How can we model things like that? So um, we create a, the so-called zonal model. Of course, the most detailed model you would do would be the, uh, the computational fluid dynamics. That would be very complicated to solve. The zonal model we created basically treat each server as a, uh, itself as a zone. And then there's the front of that server and the back of that server as, as two other zones. And we create something that's similar to the physical layout. but Instead of a distributed parameter problem, we turn it into a long parameter problem. Uh, this is the s experimental setup. We, uh, one of the key parameters actually is the pressure uh, at different height of the in front of the rack. So these are a bunch of pressure sensors. Um, and then we, we build a model on a spatial model based on these zones and what workload and on and off conditions of these servers. And we train that model. That's uh, way, uh, how, how well we can predict that by uh, turning off a server, the temperature goes up and gradually goes down. Now the ugly part. Uh, what makes everything that I said so far not so well is the uh, virtualization. Virtualization is great. Um, it is one ultimate way of improving the server utilization. As I showed you before, the server utilization is about 20%. Uh, 
in, in, in Tipa, this is almost across the board in, in almost all Microsoft servers and, and all the other services I know of. Uh, just the nature of that workload and the, how the softwares are built. Uh, the way to counter that is to say, let's run multiple VMs on, on the server, on, on the physical server, and so they can share the resources. What that uh, complicate things is really the mixture of the physical hierarchy and the logical hierarchy. Now your single application will go across multiple servers, in fact across multiple VMs on multiple servers. And every server now are shared by multiple VMs from different applications. Uh, so that mixture makes your, your control fairly complicated because you can't control a server anymore. When you touch a server, you're actually essentially touching multiple applications. Um, so all these problems that's fairly intuitive in, in the traditional control uh, terms <laughs> become uh, more complicated, right? Observability, how can we know the power utilization of a VM within a physical server? Can we, how can we measure that? Uh, how do we control it? We, not, we cannot control just the DVFS uh, of the CPU anymore. We have to control individual VMs. Um, and we have to understand the implication of controlling one VM both correspond to what's living on that physical machine and across machines with other part of the same application. Uh, if we do everything in software, since everything is virtualized, the only way we can do it is pretty much in software, will that be too slow? Can I have good enough response time um, to, to either track a power curve or just even do power capping? Um, coordinations among multiple controllers. When the system scale, uh, we may have stability problems. And the, the, the modeling and control itself may not be st uh, scalable enough. So the first thing we did is we call the VM Joule meter. It's a software way of uh, estimating how much power is consumed in a per VM sense. So um, in the traditional way, people look at uh, CPU and memory and disk utilizations and can train a model that can uh, resemble, right, at the physical level, what the uh, power consumption of a server is. In the virtual machine world, uh, turns out if we do carefully, the virtual machine uh, actually tracks all the in, uh, individual VMs utilization. And by putting them together, we can um, do pretty well in terms of uh, attributing the power consumption to individual virtual machines. Uh, we're running that experiment yeah, using the spec CPU benchmark, is, uh, which is a benchmark of uh, uh, high, high CPU utilization type of workload roughly see about 3%, uh, uh, less than 3% of error in the predicted uh, power consumption uh, per VM. And that's in part with most of the physical meters. And um, so we're pretty confident that we can model individual VMs, how much they consume. Now the second question to ask is, can software act fast enough? So. Uh, taking the power tracking or power capping uh, example, if I have a problem with the total power consumption from a bunch of servers, uh, usually these problems come from a pretty uh, uh, from the UPS level where uh, there's a limit on how much the the, uh, the circuit can uh, the, the the current can be pumped out. Uh, it has to go through a bunch of circuit breakers. Um, if I decide that there's a problem on one of these layers of uh, power consumption, I want to cap some VMs so that they, if they're not important, uh, they should spend less power, then uh, I have to go through a, a sequence of actions. So uh, first we need to understand what's the response time, what's the, the limit, the deadline of the response time is. Uh, this is a chart you may not be able to read it very uh, clearly, but this is the chart of the, uh, how the circuit breaker uh, would behave. That uh, this is a 400 watt circuit, uh, a 400 amp uh, circuit breaker. If it's less than 400, the way you'd read it, if it's less than uh, 400 amps, uh, it stays forever, right? It doesn't break. 
Uh, if it's higher than that, there's actually a gradual curve that shows you how much the current is and how long the circuit breaker can, can sustain. Um, this is in a, a logarithmic chart. Uh, essentially, with 10 times, this is the 10 times, right? 10 times the, uh, the, the spec current, it can stay for about a second. So 400, watt, uh, 400 amp circuit, if you, if you run 4,000 amps, it can still be on for a second. And if you say two, twice of that, it can actually uh, stay uh, safe for about 20 seconds. So that's the tolerance we have in there. Um, we also need to understand how much of a spike, how big a spike we can, we can generate. There we did some experiment on several different kinds of servers. Because of the power supplies in the server themselves and all the capacitance in the circuit, the spike in the workload may not directly translate to the spike in the outside of the server. Uh, immediately. So it takes, for in this case, uh, for this Xeon server, about 100 milliseconds, which is the fast spike we can tell, and for another server, actually takes 200 milliseconds. So there are some leeways when the workload goes up or goes down. There's some uh, response time we need to worry about. So uh, a time chart would be like this. If at my circuit breaker level I detect and say uh, we need to react to a, a power capping command, uh, it would take a while, say uh, like a millisecond level com uh, communication delay to get that command into individual servers. Uh, the server needs to go through all the OS and uh, uh, settings. And um, at this time, finally, the OS decide, OK, I need to <coughs> change the virtual machine settings. And it take another maybe half a second to, um, to, to see the power decrease. So at the end, we see about 400 milliseconds. This is, and this is only for, uh, for every VM, we can get about 10 to 20 watt of the accuration. So uh, we, we can, within that 20 second uh, leeway, uh, have multiple of these control loops uh, to react to uh, things that, um, that's going bad. So the, it's actually feasible to do uh, software-based uh, power control. On the accuracy side, uh, there are actually multiple ways to reduce the power consumption of a virtual machine uh, once things get virtualized. Not just DVFS, which is a physical setting, but also the amount of CPU time you're willing to give a virtual machine. So uh, the uh, a little complicated side is by using these different uh, uh, knobs, you can essentially get different uh, performance for the same application. So some may tolerate the uh, CPU time a little better, some may tolerate the DVFS setting a little better, and the controller needs to dynamically decide how much uh, where in this performance curve it, it, it want, this, uh, want to set the application to. <coughs> so uh, we come up with this um, a little complicated hierarchical control framework that at the uh, physical level, at the data center level, there's a, uh, there's a controller that <coughs> essentially operate at the, at the uh, physical side, right? You look at the uh, power consumption setting, you look at all the circuit breaks, and you give settings to, uh, to each of the applications running that, uh, on there. And then uh, there's the application level. This has become pure logical. So we have a pure physical layer controller, pure logical layer controller. But at the bottom of it, when you get to the virtual machines, that become a sort of a mixture of the two. So we, we try to control the virtual things to achieve the physical goal. So we, we're using a model predictive control to um, to learn and predict how each application react to either DFS or uh, or uh, CPU, CPU time uh, knobs, and then propagate that back to high-level controllers. This is a experiment uh, using 40 VMs on 10 servers. Uh, we have three priorities, so uh, uh, we, we set three different priorities of these VMs. There's some, uh, say the stock trader, you want them to be real-time, you want to preserve their performance no matter what, uh, web services, medium, and some scientific benchmarks, say spec CPU running it, nobody cares, you can delay them. Um, without any capping, uh, 
this again is using the uh, the complement of that uh, uh, UPS charging curve. So essentially, you have uh, less power than later. You have more when the UPS charge uh, is fully charged. Uh, without any control, you see a lot of uh, times the power consumption exceeds what you what you can uh, what you can give. Uh, just with the physical controller, uh, that's the red one. You sti still see a lot of uh, places that you go up. And with a more dynamic control, uh, you have a few places where you need power capping. Other than that, actually, the adjustment of the workload itself uh, can keep the power consumption uh, below what you have in the supply. So that's the power uh, control story. And the other story is the uh, energy control. And uh, we want to make sure that when we run different VMs, the total energy uh, is, um, is not degraded by so much, or we don't necessarily use more energy we need it when we run them in, the indi uh, in the individual cases. Uh, what this really boils down to is to understand the interference between the VMs. So apparently, when you put two VMs on the same physical machine, um, they interfere with, with each other. A lot of that came from the shared cache, because even though you can put the two VMs on two different cores on the same CPU, because they share the last level cache, um, they're going to fetch and keep data in that cache in a very different way. So essentially, one guy can load a bunch of data and kick all the data the other guy uh, stored uh, previously out of the cache. And the, the next guy was scheduled in and kick this guy's data out of the cache. And they can essentially get this fight. Uh, how bad that would be? Um, this is again the spec CPU benchmark. We observed something as high as 125%, meaning if I put two VMs together on the same machine, although they have the, uh, in, uh, they, they all, all have their own cores, I'm seeing everybody slow down by half. So that's the situation you don't want to have. Essentially, you have to spend twice of the energy to run them. Uh, and some other, other apps are, are quite friendly. They don't have that much uh, 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 slowdown. So how can, we, how can we characterize this and use that in the scheduling? Uh, the way we come up with is to quantify and predict how different VMs will interfere with each other by modeling their cache pressure. So we think of if you put a VM here, we designed a, a cache benchmark and say, OK, how much this VM, unknown VM, will, will give pressure on my benchmark, right? make my benchmark slow down. At the same time, uh, once we do enough profiling, now we can model the VM just using a cache pressure, uh, cache profiler. So this VM, from the cache pressure point of view, behave like one of the known benchmarks I have. So that way, I can, uh, it can both model how much this guy, this bad guy, behaves on other, other people and also uh, how much this guy itself will get uh, degraded when, when we place them. So with that knowledge, now we can think about a framework of consolidating and migrating VMs uh, in a performance-aware way. We can select the best VMs, to sort of they, they match each other, to put on the same server so nobody got slowed down as much. Um, the framework looks like this. We have customer VMs. These are cloud services. People give us VMs. We don't, we don't control them. We don't know much of, about them. But we do uh, profiling on these VMs. We run them with the, uh, the cache profiler. And we model them. Uh, this is by running them on a staging server. We don't uh, first deploy them directly into the hosting rack. And after we model them, we put them, uh, we design a, a, a consolidation algorithm to select the best combinations of them to put onto the racks. Over the time, of course, some VMs will quit, some VMs will change their behavior, and so on. Uh, then we need to periodically migrate and reconsolidate uh, what's deployed. So this interference aware VM problem, is a consolidation problem, is fairly interesting in the sense that um, it's when you have only two cores, or well, you want to allow two VMs to share a physical machine, the problem is, for, is polynomial. So you can have the best solution in polynomial time. Once you have three cores, 
uh, it become NP card, and um, uh, no uh, polynomial time uh, algorithm is, uh, can be found. Uh, the heuristic would say, okay, let's do all feasible combinations of, of uh, consolidation, and then we sort them. We say, okay, this pair or this group has less interference than the other group, so we go them in that order, and then just put one, pa one pass and say, okay, I've already decided on this group, now I'm going to select the best among the rest, what the other groups have the least interference. So uh, with that algorithm, is, uh, the good news is uh, we can have something that's provably uh, polynomial time, uh, uh, can have polynomial time approximation. So with that algorithm, we are uh, not too bad in terms of the energy consumption of the optimal uh, uh, placement. Uh, here k is the number of cores, so log k is even with, uh, 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 say, eight cores, that's like three. Um, the other problem now is the migration problem. This, this is uh, even worse than the consolidation problem that, uh, again, if K is, is two, if we only consider two core uh, or two VM packing together is polynomial. Uh, beyond that is MP hard, and it turns out also probably MP hard to approximate. So there's essentially no good algorithm. And we come up with one heuristic, we run it on, um, a bunch of uh, workload, it seems to be uh, behaving quite well. So here's a result from simulation uh, using 1,000 VMs and four cores. Uh, the energy, there's a small amount of energy gain, but the bigger gain comes from we don't have to run uh, as many servers because every server adds 60% of the overhead of turn them on. And um, the total cost of ownership gain uh, it's, it turns out to be 20% by using a more naive uh, uh, placement and migration policy versus uh, our heuristics. So um, let me conclude. Um, so I showed you that uh, data centers are large and complex system. They involve physical variables and logical variables, lots of interactions among them. Um, but with enough data collection and modeling and, and, um, uh, and control, we believe we can eventually understand them. Now the interesting question is, once we really understand them, my belief is we shouldn't build any data centers. Um, take it seriously in the sense of, right, companies like Microsoft, like Google and, and, and the cloud providers invest huge amount of money in the order of tens of billion dollars of building this bearing a huge risk, right? The risk part is, is, is what essentially could kill all these companies that if you don't have good workload to run on them, you're having a huge infrastructure for nothing, nothing good. But because of, the, because of the fact we're not ending standing very well, we have to build them vertically. We have to from build the infrastructure, the power distribution, all the way to applications. The ideal model, if we can come up with abstractions and models that, that we understand them, then we can, ha uh, we can hash this up. Right? We can have a tier of companies that just build and maintain managed utilities, just like the power suppliers and the power generation companies. Uh, companies like cloud service providers would be customers for that. If we have uh, the, the demand part and the supply part can, can talk to each other and manage well, then the cloud providers don't have to bury as much risk they can just get the resources when they need to and uh, delinquent the resource when they don't need to. So that would be a model that I see that when we really understand data centers, uh, that where we can go to. All right, thank you. They are. Uh, there, there are techniques uh, called the page coloring. So essentially you can separate the cache and say this VM only use this part of cache, this VM use the, 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 the other part. Uh, experiments show that performance-wise that's worse than you can possibly share the cache because a lot of 
clients, you don't, uh, they don't interfere, and they can actually um, benefit from having the access to the other part of the cache. Ah, okay. It's a, there's an organization called ASHRAE, American Society of Cooling and something. Um, so they come up with these specs, and uh, as you probably see one of the places I see this uh, psychometric chart. Um, ah, stop reacting. Um, that, that's where this weird shaped wedge chart is. And uh, there's a few bounding boxes in there. One, the orange colored bounding box, which is what the ASHRAE specs, the operations are. Uh, they consult with computer manufacturers and, and sort of create these industrial consortium and say, this would be the data center operating model, suggested. And then we try to relax them by giving them much larger bounding box. So I hope I can. This is, this is what the chart look like. This tiny little thing, so this and say, Ashray says, you oper uh, data center should operate between 20 degree and 25 degree. And this is 45 to 55 uh, percent humidity. So that's the bounding box. I think later, they, uh, in the recent years, they enlarged that into this orange box. And in Microsoft, we're experimenting with this huge black box so we can relax it by a lot. We can use outside air. Uh, more humidity, and, and uh, as long as you don't have condensation, as long as you don't create static, it's fine. And the, the Could be the, a lot of these are sort of company specific. They all have their own risk factor, their own right. Uh, depending on what kind of workload they run, I know the banks are much more conservative in terms of how they manage their facility than some of the cloud service providers. Um, there's no unified sort of definition of that. Can you comment on 60% absorption rate of cost? Why so high? So just having the CPU running idle, right? All the, all the, all the, the um, no problem. No problem. This is zero percent utilization, but it's still running no ops. Right, and the OS will come in and do some kind of garbage cleaning and all that. All the peripherals, uh, the hard disk is spinning, the memory has a percentage of utilization, uh, just because the memory, uh, the, the OS uh, is on that. So all that is, is about 60%. But there is no way to make the There are some improvement uh, in the last few years, people are saying, we're going to turn off the peripherals. If we're not using USB port, let's turn that off. Uh, the CPUs are designed more modular as well. You can turn off different portion of that or change the, the, the cache uh, pipeline and things like that. But no, no big improvement. Right? Still, we're looking at 40 to 60%. And the losses in the, the Yeah. The leaking current is uh, the leaking. the leaking current is not that significant. So that uh, the leaking current is this part. That's the leaking current. Oh, that's small. Right. That's that's tiny. But this is mainly the memory has to be on. Right. The CPU is running some no ops, and uh, the peripherals are on. The network card is on. Microsoft. Yes. <laughs> um, right. The model I can I, I I would like to see is maybe utility companies. Those are people who understand power uh, should go and build data centers to provide high level services, and cloud service providers can just hedge their risk and get whatever they can. And depending on uh, where the the demand is, the weather conditions. Uh, all those, they can choose the best data center at the cheapest cost to run different things. 
Uh, it could be. There's a, right, there's a lot of things in there that, that, um, that are open questions, right? Uh, migrating a large amount of data, right? Uh, the network bandwidth is an issue. Uh, security, definitely, whether we trust the host or not. Um, so I wanted to make a general comment because last year, well, yesterday, I gave a talk on security to begin. So this is like in microcosm the same thing, except for you, the you consider the supply inelastic is there, right? And you are playing with the demand. Right. And all what I was talking about yesterday, demand could be often inelastic, assumed by utilities, and you control it, schedule your power plants on and off to meet many customers. So, I mean, this last idea about who is building and who is responsible for the risk, I think it's uh, one of the biggest questions because you can, anybody can take the risk at the value. Right? Right. And right now utilities have no clue about your demand at that level. Exactly. Of so they are not going to, they're going to overcharge you. They're going exactly. to overcapacity, so you won't win that way either. You probably heard a recent news that um, I think these cloud service providers sign a contract to the utilities, I'm going to use this much, right. and later they become more efficient, and the utility company will charge them for using less. Yes, yes, that's exactly what. So maybe one more question before we break for lunch. My question is slightly uh, different from the main presentation. What I want to know is that how do you pay the power utilities for the power you're consuming? Price the day or it is it, different, in different, hours. It different from site to site, essentially. There, because well, we're dealing with what well, Microsoft is dealing with uh, several of these uh, uh, power providers, and each of them, depending on the region, they have different policies. Some we sign a sort of uh, a uniform price, and this is how much we consume. This is how much we pay. Some we sign a contract like. Um, uh, this is the daytime consumption, this is the nighttime consumption, and different price. Some are like, this is the consumption and we're going to pay you more if we get, if we, if we use more, that's the, uh, the overhead and uh, higher price, and so on. So this is all very different. And uh, there are people, essentially, you can play the games, right, based on the price and the demand to uh, distribute the workload from, um, from uh, two different places, so you can take advantage of the price variations. Uh, has there been any work in this direction? Yeah, there are a few papers published. We have a paper, uh, MIT has a paper on that. At least, I, I think I've seen three or four papers now. On that. I think you guys have a paper on that as well. Or? Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. But it's, I think, from a Google or Microsoft that you guys were buying electricity for the data center, let's say in New Jersey, you're buying it in, in Illinois, you know, if you have a contract where it's cheaper. So is that you or Google? Somebody I, I don't know. <laughs> it, that, but that's, that's entirely possible. That's what we will be hearing when we write our paper. There's one last question, yeah. if it's quick. <laughs> You mean energy storage or? Energy storage, energy storage is definitely used uh, there. There are, uh, what I show is a s more simpli sim simplistic picture that when we have a site level GPS, uh, people are looking at a d how to distribute that, right? Uh, you can have a smaller, I believe Google uses laptop batteries at every server, uh, or you can have different, uh, uh, storage technologies, the different tiers, to try to match the best to your workload. This is interesting, we can, we can take this offline, there's interesting characteristics about the, uh, the storage capacity of these, uh, these particular uh, battery technologies and how much current it can pump out, right, the throughput. And depending on whether you're dealing with uh, mitigating the spikes or you're dealing with supplying it in the long run, uh, you may choose different uh, battery technology. So we'll break for lunch, thank you. Thank you. Small, uh, oh, thank you. Hopefully it works okay to make you a couple problems.